This is the ground floor. What's up, everybody, and welcome once again to The Ground Floor, episode three of our brand new podcast. My name is Jesse Finver, and along with me today, yet another very, very cool guest, David Dobkin, known for The Judge, Wedding Crashers, and a whole host of other things. <laughs> David, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Jesse. Yeah, so you have, I, I was doing a lot of research before this, and you have just a very, very cool career, not just doing movies, but you started doing music videos, yeah. if, if I'm correct. I want to start with that. You, your first music video was with Tupac, yes. which is just, like, for me, that was in 1993, I was born in 95, so, like, that, like, even predates me, <laughs> um, but still, like, Obviously, I know who Tupac is. I listened to his music, yeah. and like he's a legend. Yeah. What was what was that like making your professional debut, working with Tupac, Tupac, who was at the time like on top of the world? Yeah, you know, um, I was. It was interesting actually. Um, at the at he was on top of the world once the video came out, but before that, he was uh, known, I guess, for having um, been upset with a video that a couple directors had done prior and had uh, very angrily um, uh, approached them in a way that made them very uncomfortable and apparently made a lot of other directors uncomfortable, which is how <laughs> I got the job because I didn't know exactly what I was getting into. I was a big rap music fan. Um, I really, uh, from a very early age, it's funny, I kind of liken that to these days when my kids are talking about, you know, all these YouTubers and gamers and people that they, that are influencing them. And they're, you know, I hear them and there's bad language sometimes on the stuff. And I, it's the same way my parents were about me listening to rap music. They were like, right. what are you listening to? But Tupac was somebody that I actually was not super familiar with. And uh, I became more familiar, obviously, once I, I did, I ended up doing two videos with him. But he is, uh, he was a very bright, very, very interesting uh, well-educated, intelligent guy who really stood um, upon both sides of a very specific story. He was kind of renowned for being the first male um, black rapper to sing about a woman's point of view of trying to grow up in that culture at the time. Um, and so when I made the first video with him, I think the first one we did was I, I Get Around, um, and I, he had just gotten this Thug Life tattoo on his stomach. Mm -hmm. So I was like, he was changing and for a scene and I saw him and I was like, hey man, why don't we just leave you with your shirt off? He's like, oh yeah, did you check the?" So we shot the whole video, basically the whole video with his shirt off. Um, and then I got a very angry phone call from Jimmy Iovine, the infamous and one of my, my um, heroes who was like, don't you understand who this is? You shot him with his shirt off and now he looks like a thug. And I'm like, he's not a that's thug. A, that's, but... a good, uh, that's a good impression right there. <laughs> yeah, he was very, very angry with me. Um, later on, it ended up being okay, but I didn't understand the dynamics of what I stepped into. But it was a great launching point. It was really amazing. And um, I had a, a great experience with him and with his mama, Faney, who was um, a really influential person in his life and later for me as well. So even before that, I mean, you had to have gotten your influences from somewhere. You were obviously, you weren't making movies yet, but you were doing no. music videos. So what, growing yeah. up, what were your big influences in filmmaking? I was another kid that saw Star Wars when I was seven years old and lost my mind and just was like, that. whatever that is, that's religion. I need to be close to that. I understand what that experience was. And then later when I was in my 12, 13, 14 year old phase, I saw Apocalypse Now and Mm -hmm. Later, Dog Day Afternoon, and these, you know, my parents were taking me to these R-rated movies that were early 80s, still felt late 70s, breaking away, whatever those were. And I never knew where I was going to sit. I went to NYU film school. I knew I wanted to be a feature filmmaker. And they, they did a very good job, although I wasn't any clear when I left what kind of filmmaker I would be. The only kind I was pretty sure I would never be was a comedy filmmaker. Um, so the irony of my career has never quite left me. I have not directed <laughs> Star Wars. I have not directed Dog Day Afternoon. 
but I made my mark in some other weird area. And I re realizing now that I was like the funny kid in school, I kind of get how I ended up there, but it was not clear by the way. And at the time, music videos were really cool. There were some oh, yeah. unbelievable music videos that were being made, you know, whether it was Peter Gabriel or for me, even later, it was Pearl Jam Jeremy that really mm -hmm. grabbed my attention. It was that it was that kind of a work that was coming out Metallica Unforgiven, the Matt Mahern video. And um, they, they were really blowing my mind what was happening. It was an art form. For a moment, it was a true art form. And I was very excited to get involved in it. The, so like MTV. And by the way, my first paying job was actually directing karaoke videos. Oh. I got a job, <laughs> I, I got people running on the beach, like that weird stuff that plays in the background at a karaoke. That was me. I did I Got You, Babe. <laughs> I did Rubber Band Man. I did a bunch of a bunch of karaoke videos. That was my first actual paying job, thousand dollars a video, um, when That's I was uh, twenty two years old. Yeah. Oh, uh, you got to start somewhere. Got to start somewhere, but I always don't. I don't want to jump past that. I don't know what influences those had. Right. No. Hey, listen, the karaoke <laughs> business is a lucrative business that needs, you know, praise. And better directors. Right. Yeah. That's <laughs> so. Um, it was like it's a good transition. You brought up, you know, you didn't think it'd be a comedy. You didn't do comedy, but you've made music videos. You've done, you pr executive produce TV shows. You do movies. You've touched a ton of different genres. Do you have a preference right. at this point? Is it like TV my, comedy, action movie? Like, what is it for you? My agents are, have always been very patient and also very frustrated with me. Um, I tend to not want to repeat myself. I tend to lose interest in whatever it is that I just did and did either poorly or well. <laughs> and um, either of those attract, uh, uh, make me want to move on. But I, you know, like right now, um, I, you know, just having done Eurovision was a lot of fun. That my last film was a real mm -hmm. blast. It was maybe my most enjoyable shoot as an experience. I think I'm getting older and wiser. And, um, you know, and I was able to bring my music video chops to that um, movie. Like that was very intentionally something that worked for me based on what I've done. What made it so enjoyable for you compared to all the other films and, and movies you worked on? You know, getting a little bit older, I hadn't done a comedy in uh, almost a decade. And, uh, you know, actually, in, I hadn't done a comedy in a decade. The Change Up was the last comedy that I did. You know, I did a, I did a TV pilot for Resident Alien, so that was fun uh, yeah. a year or two ago. Um, but besides that, I had done Into the Badlands. I'd done The Judge. I'd done um, a, a reboot of, of Iron Fist for Marvel. I, I just didn't really... Um, I hadn't done comedy and Will Ferrell sent me the script and I thought it was hilarious and it was a world I'd never heard of. I had never heard of Eurovision. <laughs> um, and I was a kind of concerned at first of parodying uh, uh, an event like that. And then I found my angle in as that what happens and I got an idea for it and it became a very personal movie for me. So is there like what is your process though when, when you get that idea and it becomes personal to you because that's what I, when i was doing my research one of the things you talked about especially with like wedding crashers which we'll get to later you yeah. said that if, if you want to do something again it needs to make sense right it needs yeah. to work so what is that process like for you you know it's interesting like somehow you're not aware of the story you're adapt when you connect with a piece of for me when i connect with a piece of material i don't know I'm, I'm not always aware of the subtext of why I'm connecting with it. You know, I had only in, as I started to work on Wedding Crashers, once I read the script and I started to add, you know, there were five scenes that I added to the original script. And it was like the two of them sitting at the Lincoln Memorial. Aren't we too old for this? You know, or, you know, we'll look back, we'll be, we're young and stupid. Yeah, but we're not really young anymore. Those, there was these little scenes that became the emotional markings of the bromance. And for me, my friends, I had no game in high school. I was a total nerd. I was a Dungeons and Dragons kid. I was five foot four at the time. I grew late. Everything, I was pale. I had braces. There, there was no female energy in my life <laughs> anywhere in the future, and I was bright enough to know that. Um, so playing Dungeons and Dragons and watching movies were my obsessions, and I w wasn't an athlete. But... So my connection with my guy friends was very, very strong. And when girls started to become part of that mix in my senior year, my relationships with my friends changed. 
all of a sudden it was like, wait a minute, this guy's got a girlfriend and he's never around without her. And then the, these other two, and you're not going to parties with just the guys. You got to drag these other girls around and their friends. And that dynamic, I realized that, you know, your friendships will live and die from that age period to the next age period based on how well you adapt with your friends and how much you care about them and how much you're willing to grow up. Um, Cause I did have friends that weren't willing to grow up yeah. and didn't dig my girlfriend when I brought her around. And then I never saw them again. So that movie I realized had that story for me in it. And I, and I, I was really able to put that through the, the middle of the film. Um, that movie that's always playing out between the two guys and that became the bromance of that movie. You know, not every movie has that. You know, I think that um, The Judge was a movie that had a very personal story for me because um, I had just lost my mother and I had lost my father when I was earlier. And the thing that I never realized is that our culture never tells us that we're going to end up parenting our parents. And that was shocking to me. You know, once you have changed the diaper for one of your parents, your life is not quite ever exactly the same and that was pretty powerful and so that movie came from that experience and you know your vision for me was kind was of ask, yeah. my was story with my wife and and me being you know in a patriarchal setup and thinking i needed to earn money and have a career and be successful and um and her being kind of who's a very creative and powerful person on her own and a very successful producer, kind of putting her career on hold for a number of years while we raised kids. And then me realizing at the end, as the, my kids got older, realizing, oh, my God, th she's had to kind of stand on the sidelines and her career is just as important as mine. And uh, that movie had that story in it or it, the bones for it. We actually pushed it forward and made it really the movie. Mm -hmm. um, and it's Again, it's why we're nominated for an Oscar is that song where he hands over the the ending of the story to her. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, like, there are personal stories and it helps you because you know what you're telling your actors. You know where you're supposed to be in a scene. You know where you're where you're trying to connect with an audience about and what you're trying to express. And I think that always helps. And it's interesting because my more successful movies all have that. And the movies where I have less of that, not that I can't relate to every story, but the movies where I have less of a personal anchor, I tend to have um, not as successful an experience as a director. Do you enjoy producing or directing more? I what's say, the biggest difference for you? There? Look, for me, I love directing way more. And, and it's, that's my first love and passion is directing and then probably writing and then producing. But I started producing because I had a lot of my own ideas. I generated a lot of ideas and I couldn't direct them all or wasn't going to be given the chance to direct some of them. So I started to take the things that I initiated and turn them into producing jobs. And I also love the experience of being able to give directors the support that either I have had with some producers or not had with other producers. You know what I mean? Right. And, and being well aware now at this point in my career that your producers have a lot to do with the outcome of your film, that if there, you need someone there fighting for you, fighting for the time, fighting for the money, and also fighting to remind you as you start to cave to the pressures of the film that, hey, remember, slow down on this day, slow down on this shot. You really had a cool idea here. Get the shot. Don't don't worry about the time. We'll get you the overtime. Like you need a partner in there that's willing to run the field with you. And um, when I've had that, you know, the Susan Downies of the world, I have had incredibly great experiences as a director and better work. Um, so I really look for that now. So for my first three years of my career, I worked in local news in Mississippi, and I was a multimedia TV journalist, uh, one man band out on my own. But our producers, it sounds like local news, national, like a producer or like doing a sports game is very different. It's a very different title than a movie producer where you're not editing the video and you're not doing that. You have film editors and you have there's different roles. Yeah. Or in a movie compared to film, like because part of but the reason why producer, they, they expect you when you come on as a director, they expect you to do all that. The <laughs> funny thing is they expect you to actually direct the movie in a weird secret way. Like they really are going, if this doesn't work, he'll make it work. If this doesn't, right. you know, 
I was very lucky. I worked with uh, these very talented directors and writers, Goldstein and Daly. They were awesome. They came to audition for the job with storyboards already done. They knew how to cover a scene. They, yeah. It was so clear that I would just be sitting on set. By the way, they because they can write their way out of a problem, and they can also direct their way. And they're excellent directors, and they've gotten better and better every movie. Um and those are an example of like a really great experience. I've had other experiences where the directors are not able to pull it together. And all of a sudden you're in the editing room, you're in the music, yeah. mix, you're in there and you're having to do all that. And that gets quite exhausting. I remember Todd Phillips having to do it on Project X. And he was like, this is like, I'm never doing this again. Like he, <laughs> he's so frustrated. And he was like, but you, you have your name on it. That so movie. it's me of pedigree of what you think you can do. Yeah, that movie came out. I think I was still in high school, and my town, my town had a party <clears throat> immediately after that movie. Like this girl threw this party, and it literally turned into Project X, where like the screen, like a door went in the pool. It wasn't a car; it was a door. And yeah, I, like it was just, <laughs> it was a massively influential movie for people my age. Let's just say, let's just say that. Yeah. But this is cool because you know, as the re one of the reasons I wanted to start this podcast is there's so many things that I don't know and I want to learn yeah. and I want the listeners to learn. And wow. for, you know, so many people you hear producer and it could mean one thing for somebody and it can mean another thing for somebody else. So in Hollywood, it's much more flexible than it is in television or live television, by the way. Yeah. Um, and I've done unscripted TV, so I know how much a producer actually shapes and is involved. Oh, yeah. They, yeah a whole like, other level. During, well, the, during the show too, like it's, 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 it's live TV. You know, it's like, like TV. Yeah. And by the way, you have to make things happen in front of the camera all the time. So yeah. you have to be, you're kind of, you're writing, you're thinking, you're doing, you're doing all of that. It's, it's, it's much more intense. Um, there are producers I have that have their names on the movies and they come to set one time, but they found the script, they developed the script or they put, got the money together, they sold it to a studio. And so they have produced the film. There are other producers that are on set with you every day. And uh, you don't want them to be there. And there's producers that are on set every day and you really want them to be there. So yeah. those are different. Uh, I mean, it's all, all about relationships. You know? It's all about relationships. That's yeah. right. All right. Let's move on. We yes. touched on Wedding Crashers. You had to know this was coming. This is, yeah. I mean, this was, I was nine when that came out, I think. Oh, or, oh, no, it was 10. You saw was, it when you were 10. I was 10. <laughs> so, so 95, yeah, 2005. I mean, you. This I'm assuming like you get asked about Wedding Crashers every single day, but you know, here we I go. I don't anymore. I like it, except for uh, you know, everybody's all over me about the sequel. Oh my God! Don't ever leave me. Ever. Good, because I'd find you. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's where I'm. I'm heading towards. <laughs> <laughs> of because there's are. been there's been lots of there's been lots of buzz. There's there's been a lot of smoke, and you know, when there's smoke, there's usually fire. Yep. I've seen. Uh, you know, Vince Vaughn reportedly confirmed that talks are happening. Isla Fisher said she'd be 100% in for a sequel. Christopher Walken and Jane Seymour both shown interest. So let's make a little news, maybe. Is there any progress? Is there any progress at all? And what would this movie look like in your mind if it did happen? This No, there is progress and we're still working on it. And, you know, no, but we haven't all come to a consensus yet about it. But, you know, there's a screenplay we've been working on for a while. Um, that is good. You know, look, I did not make the sequel. They wanted the sequel immediately. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, to my own, uh, well, you said you get bored, I, you get bored and you want to move on. And I should have. And, and we sat and Vincent Owen and I sat down, but we really didn't want to make a movie that was the same movie again. Like, you a don't hang, mean, like, like a hangover to a hangover two, where it's the exact yeah, same yeah, yeah. plot. It's the same movie, same plot, same idea. And, yeah. and we, I didn't understand that. I felt cheap doing it at the time, by the way, there was no hangover two to look right. at, or I right, probably right. would have made the movie if I knew it. Could, knew it could. <laughs> but I felt so good about the movie and the movie was special to me. And I, and I was like, I don't see a reason to go do this. Um, Ironically enough, I did go to Vincent Owen to go to make I now pronounce you Chuck and Larry together as two firefighters that have to pretend that they are in a in a yeah. gay relationship. Of course. Um, which we were not able to agree on that movie, but it would have been a huge follow up and would have been very funny eventually. But it became Adam. Yeah. Um, but I, uh, you know, about five years ago. The, and I had an idea and I was like, well, I like it better looking through this lens of what was created, this Lemon Mathow pairing. Right. And 
I like the idea of what it's like for older men. So, you know, what happens when you end up being, you know, in that next stage of life? And, you know, one of them was about sex moving on to love. And this one's about something different. But but we found a story. We found a story that when I took it to the boys, they really, really loved it. And uh, we've all been crafting it and discussing it. And the script is very funny. And uh, we'll just we'll see if we can pull it together. It would be really, really fun to revisit it. And I do love the fact that it's authentically a good movie. It's not, you know, we waited so long. There's no cashing out on this. Right, we're, like, back you, you square, we're back to square one with the studio. But the movie is good enough. And we always told each other, like, we're not going to do it unless we think we can do it great. I mean, we talked for 20 minutes. You strike me as the guy who isn't going to just go for the cash grab. You want to make something real. No. I mean, I would like the cash grab. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I, of course. I, but I, 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 I will tell you a piece of advice to everybody listening. You know, and I and I and uh, you know this and to 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 quote the great Jack Antonoff, don't take the money. You know, the two movies that I I got paid the most on were the two movies that I'm most frustrated with when I look back. I like a lot of the movie, those two movies, but they were movies where I was jam I went in faster than I was ready. I, I, you know, there were reasons and excuses and all kinds of things. It was not natural to my process as you and I just discussed a little bit earlier. Right. Um, and, and the movies came out okay and they're good. And I actually have some people that love them. And, uh, but they were, uh, movies that, you get distracted by the, that kind of a thing. And we all do, you know, when, when you're a kid that started off, you know, caddying at a golf course and, and working as a bar back and doing all that stuff and painting houses and all that. And somebody puts a real check in front of you and your parents think you're never going to earn a living as an artist. You tend to say, yes, I can do this. And after wedding crashes, you start to think you can do anything. Mm -hmm. And then you need a couple big flops to really wake you up. <laughs> and then you reset. But if you can avoid that and you keep keep just sticking with it and you, and you do it for the right reasons. And again, part of what I love about the idea of a, a sequel to this movie is we're in not in a position to capitalize on anything but a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. I feel yeah. that. You know, you mentioned flops. How do you deal with failure? I mean, you're a big movie director. And there's pressure, studio, there's a ton there, of money being put in. How do you deal with that? It's hard. You know, um, Fred Claus was a financial, you know, um, flop at first. It ended up not being as bad as we thought. It ended up actually probably coming into profit eventually. Um, and it's somehow become a perennial Christmas movie. Yeah, it's like a cult classic. At this yeah, point. And, and, um, but that movie cost more than, you know, it should have. Um it was very complicated how it all got put together. I turned it down four times before I said yes, huh. um, uh, which is great for negotiating your fee. And, and <laughs> but that movie is very—it's very hard to have a flop like that, you know. And it's mm -hmm. very hard um, to stomach it. And at the time, I didn't have kids. And by the way, I was an R-rated director that was trying to figure out how to do PG. I was started as a PG-13 movie, and it became a PG movie. And I was kind of without my bearings, honestly, you know, my comedic bearings and everything I thought was funny on set. The producers were like, no, 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 you can't say that. You can't do that. You can't say that. And I was, I was, I was not in the right place at the right time with that. But the, but the failure of it is pretty devastating. I don't think on the outside I ever take it in because I'm like, eh, it's baseball. I went to the, I went to the plate and I whiffed, right. you know what I mean? Like you're going to yeah. strike out in the world series. Someone's going to strike out in the world series. It happens. Um, and quite frankly, if you can knock one out of three movies out of the ballpark, you're an all-star. That's it is baseball odds. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, um, you put it in terms I can understand. I appreciate that. Yeah, <laughs> and, and so I love baseball too. So it, so I just, for me, it was really, it was hard, but I moved on. Later, I realized that I was going through all kinds of mental, emotional gymnastics of going through it but in the moment i'm usually a bit of a bull um change up was a movie that also didn't work financially it wasn't that big a swing it wasn't it, you know what, what didn't cost that much money the movie made part it profited but it was a movie that tested extremely high and it ran great in the theater and it got marketed wrong you know they thought they marketed it softer 
they would get a bigger audience. But it's like tricking people into the theater. And that is a way more raunchy movie than Wedding Crashers is. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, even though it was a sh shit ton of fun with an audience, if an audience doesn't know they're about to get a movie that raunchy and you sell it with the baby with the finger in the nose, then you're going to get people come in and people in my difference between my testing audience, which tested in 88, it's a very high cost yeah. on, that, on that movie. Um, we thought we ha had a hit on our hands. They thought they had a hit on their hands. And then they doubled down to make it look like it was PG-13. By the way, they had a great R-rated campaign. But they went with big day glow colors and babies, yeah. fingers in the noses. And people went into that movie and they were shocked. And, and that audience, you could see, you come out of a test screening where the audience has not been marketed to yet. You test an 88. The audience comes out and all of a sudden you're in the low 70s. And that'll kill you. You know, and that is part, by the way, that's just part of the business. Um, I've seen that movie recently, actually. I didn't see it since the premiere, but my 13-year-old son came back really angry that he hadn't seen any of my R-rated movies and everyone had just camp had uh, two summers ago. He's like, I'm the only kid that hasn't seen Wedding Crashers of the Change Up. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay. And I showed him the movie and I was like, wow. I would love to take three minutes out of the some of these set pieces. I think this is a is a much stronger movie in there that I think would be a little more palatable, even though I think it's very, very funny and it was really enjoyable to watch. All right, but so those three cool. movies were hard. Those yeah. were hard movies. And the second movie, I had just sold a huge King Arthur script that was really good and I was very proud of and I'd worked a number of years on. And that movie, I think, unspokenly got shut down because of the change up not opening. Interesting. I think the studio. Like when you say up. shut down, like they just like didn't put like their full effort into like marketing it. We, and, were, and that, we were greenlit. We were making the movie. You know, we had Gary Oldman playing Merlin. Kit Harrington was playing Arthur. Joel Kinnaman was playing Lancelot. We had we were talking to Marianne Cotillard. We were talking to Liam Neeson. It was a very cool yeah. thing happening with that movie. I'd watch that with and that cast. All of a sudden, we were 15 million over budget, which. Is a lot, but it was a hundred and fifteen million dollar movie, and uh, they pulled the plug, wanted to recast. There was no faith in Kit Harrington. They were like, "Who is this guy?" It was only five episodes into season one of Game of Thrones at that time, and they, <laughs> did, they, did, they did not. They were not going to bet on him, and they weren't going to bet on Joel. And they said recast the movie, and it became there was a conversation with McAvoy, and Colin Farrell was on for a second, and then off, and and then the script for the judge came in, and it was solid and we were really excited and downey called me and said i have a slot open let's go make this so i left made the judge and when i came back there was a, a new king arthur built at warner brothers which is the movie that everybody saw right yes because i was gonna say like wait i don't remember john snow in king arthur like wait a no. second <laughs> nope. well, I, can show you, I can show you in a, a casting a tape audition between those two that was spectacular i that's some pretty fantastic trivia though like yeah. oh like remember john snow he, he's almost king arthur um yeah. all right i know you only got a couple more minutes left uh, yeah sorry man yeah no, it's all good uh one of my good friends andy he's also the producer on this show uh he's a huge he wanted me to let you know first of all he's a huge fan of the judge and two, he's moving out to L.A. in the summer in hopes of becoming a film producer. What's some advice you can give him on, or anyone doing this on how to break into the film industry? Material. If you can write, write. Mm -hmm. And then control the material. If you can't write and you see a story in a newspaper, an article, whatever, get the story. Then find a writer and put it together. If you control the material in this town, you can control everything. Mm -hmm. that is really the key to successful producing and then from there you can if the material is good all of a sudden you you know out of nowhere you get this actor that actor that person attached this director and you're off making movies but i gotta say that it's all about material and it's about whether you can spot a great story and uh what you can do to help put that together that's that's the most important part of producing david dobkin everybody thank you so much for coming on the show i really appreciate it Thank you, buddy. Nice questions. Good talking to you. You too. Thank you.